And good morning. Welcome to Sunrise Daily. I'm Chamberlain Osama. Well, it's a beautiful Tuesday morning. Welcome to the show. I'm Kyrie Okikilu. Good morning. Welcome to Sunrise Daily on Channels Television. I am Bukola Samuel Wemimo. It's a foggy day here in Abuja and the Federal Capital Territory. Good morning. I'm Mark Welkin Yusuf. Well, yes, indeed. And good to also see that, uh, I mean, yesterday while we, that video was all over the place concerning, remember those kidnapped train passengers, how the videos came out and uh, not a very good sight. But then uh, the morning after that, you saw the protesters, the families of those kidnapped people just thought, look, they've had it. Uh, the authorities needed to do something because we had also highlighted that whatever was being done, they needed to know. So that clearly just showed that there was that communication gap. And so they thought they needed to take the message out there. So they picketed the office of the Ministry of Transport in protest, saying they want something to be done to get their loved ones back. And then not long after, uh, three of those kidnappers since were released. And so um, quite a lot going on in that mix. And much as yes, it's good to see um, them being released. And uh, yeah, you, you could just imagine what they might have just gone through, the kind of harrowing experiences they might have gone through. But there's still so many. Uh, questions, but yes, of course, there'll be questions about those who are still in captivity. So, what is being done? Uh, it's that you can't even get guarantees in this kind of scenario to expect that since these uh, three have been released, the others will be. But of course, you have to hope and uh, keep fingers crossed, hoping that uh, no harm will come to them beyond the harrowing experiences they've already been through. So, that is the situation at the moment. You know, since March the 28th, and, you know, we need to keep reiterating this, March the 28th. In just two days, it will be, what, April, May, June, four July, months. four months yeah. since these people were kidnapped, over 60 of them, 62 in fact. And, you know, this instrumental release, if I could just call it that, clearly there's a, this is a strategy, oh. really, because uh, you remember the government saying, you know what, just let's, let's focus on the, on, on the issues because it's a very tricky one for the family members. A lot of them, I recall one of the family members saying, seeing the video, seeing that their relatives are still wearing the same clothes they wore before they took the train. The same thing for four months. It just depends how much, uh, what they're going through. So imagine for the family members, and yes, we'll keep talking about these things. So that's what's happening, right? The family members have to go through this day in, day out. I'm talking 24 hour, a 24 hour shift, have to worry, wonder, pray, hope. I mean, you saw what they looked like during the protests yesterday. A lot of them at their wits end, just, you know, this I can't, I can't put words to just how I imagine, uh, you know, uh, them going through this right now. But instrumental release, yes, it's a bit cheery here and there. About 42 of them left in captivity, or 40 actually. We've seen about 22 released so far. But the question is, uh, how were they released? What conditions were met? What kind of negotiations did the family have with the terrorists? You recall the terrorists saying they don't have plans to keep them uh, for more than a week. Lots of questions flood in my mind. What happened on Friday? You recall one of the relatives saying that, well, they wanted to try and intervene, go get, uh, you know, some of them that were sick. Perhaps there was talk about ransom as well, but they were blocked by government, and that was when we saw the flogging video. So right now, this morning, the only thought running through my mind is, what are they going through right now? I mean, Mark West said it's a foggy day in Abuja. So what happens when it's raining? What happens when it's sunny? What happens when, when they need to feed, when they need to do the usual things that we do? I don't know if that doesn't worry anybody. It, it worries, I imagine, lots of Nigerians. And I'm glad the Minister of Transport, well, the new Minister of Transport spoke to them saying, well, he will make sure that this is the first thing he achieves in office. I think it's enough to hold on to, uh, in as much as we don't really uh, want to hold on to words of government officials, but I think it's enough to hold on to, to expect something good out of this. Indeed, um, if the Minister of Tra new Minister of Transport has said that that's the first assignment that he, uh, he they would tackle head on, it's cherry news. It's, you know, it's, it's the best thing that we've heard from government so far since the kidnap of the Abuja Kaduna train travelers, you know, the video from Sunday evening was an assault on not just the psyche of the family members, 
you know, was an assault on the psyche of um, Nigerians generally. And, you know, you could feel um, the pain, you know, in the comments that trailed that video. Uh, the Nigerians were going through were practically um, mourning alongside the family members of the Abuja Kaduna train victims. But for how long? You know, it's a wonderful thing we're talking about it today, but very soon we're going to move on. And the remaining 42 um, captives will remain in the den of the, of the kidnappers. It's, and, you know, Kadi talked about the questions that we should ask of those that have been released, you know, uh, subsequently since March 28th that they were kidnapped, how many were released as a result of, you know, the negotiations that uh, government was involved in. That situation room that Mr. President called for not long after they are kidnapped, has it been created, you know, what's the negotiation, what's, what, what, what's, what's the nature of the talks between government and these insurgents, these kidnappers? Um, what's, what is government offering? What are the kidnappers offering? The last we heard was that um, the children that they asked for to, to be released had been released. But then some family members have since paid 100 million naira. The three that were released yesterday, or was it two days ago, what gave? You know, just in case ransom was paid, it's as if the country continues to feed the demon of insurgency, emboldening the kidnappers. And little wonder that they threatened to kidnap Mr. President and the governor of Kaduna State. So these are the things that we should continue to talk about. I, 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 I think we should keep you know, uh, track of the number of days that these um, captives are spending in, in the den of the kidnappers. How comfortable are they? Uh, they're not you know, um, uh, having access to their usual uh, daily routine. They're away from the comfort of their loved ones. You know, what they're going through is best left uh, to the imagination, Malkwe. I don't know what I want to add to this, uh, Buki. Uh, you know, since yesterday, what am I saying since yesterday? You know, since this incident occurred, I have, you know, just been thinking about how, you know, the family members um, ha are coping. I'll give you a little story. Uh, two weeks before this incident occurred, a family member had just come to visit here in Abuja, and uh, she was a young lady. She is a young lady uh, who had just been deployed for service. Her place of service was Kaduna, and uh, she had never been out of her state before. She schooled all her life in Benin, and it was her first time in Abuja. She was very excited, and she was hoping to go to uh, Kaduna, but she was also hoping to redeploy to, back to Abuja somehow. And I was, you know, trying to encourage this young lady that, oh, look, you know, Nigeria is big, it's beautiful, you have to explore the country. Uh, we can start by the train service, you know, that there is a lovely train service that goes from here to Kaduna. You need to experience it. She was full of enthusiasm. She went on that train ride. She was still in camp uh, when this attack occurred. And I asked myself, Malkwe, if this attack had, her, had occurred while she was on the train, what would you have you know, told her family members? What would you have told them about the enthusiasm which you were preaching uh, to this young lady? Uh, and I think it's that, that thought that keeps you know, coming at me every time I think about these people who are in the forest. We've been there for four months. Um, I don't know. I, usually, sometimes there's strength in numbers for those who are being released. Um, you know, I know that their family members are happy, but for those who are left, you know, they keep wondering. I'm sure they're wondering when will it be our turn? Is this how they'll keep, you know, taking out from the numbers and reducing them by the day, um, or is something drastic going to happen? The Nigerian state needs to do better. I'm glad that the minister of the new minister of transport has said. This is going to be his assignment. We pray that God gives him success in this, um, as well as those who are working. I want to believe. I, wa I do not want to believe that people have given up. I want to believe that people are working behind the scenes to see how they can um, you know, get these people rescued. Because it, it, it drives at the heart of what Nigeria is, of who she is, of whether or not she cares for her citizens. Uh, yesterday, we were all celebrating Toby Amoson and 
the feat which she was able to achieve abroad. Um, but all of that celebration comes to naught when we look at what we're doing with regards to those that are here who need our help, who need the might of the state to move in and save them from the mouth of terrorists. We cannot be helpless as a country and the entire people, 200 million of us, helpless in the face of a bunch of, we've been told, ragtag terrorists. This cannot be. I'm hoping, you know, that we will be able to do better and swiftly too. Four months is already too long. We're happy that three people have been released again, but this piecemeal release is no, not doing anybody any good. I really, my heart really goes out to those who are still in the forest, you know, and how much longer they have to tolerate this. Let it not be that we, we established a train service and, you know, Nigerians, I mean, so to, as we speak, because of the insistence of those people, that that train service cannot start again because it has not delivered the passengers uh, which she took from Abuja to Kaduna. Uh, we might have started the train service, but we cannot have started something and we will not finish it because of a group of terrorists. I believe that Nigeria can do better and I know that she'll do better. Ladies and gentlemen. Well, yes, indeed, you know, but uh, the authorities need to improve their communication, either with the family members or relevant people, such that, because that goes a long way. Good to see and hear that the Minister of Transport says, give me time, we will do this. So we'll expect a lot more information coming through from that ministry. But that said, let's go to the ladies and see how things are reflected today. Welcome back. Let's take you through some of the dailies here today. We start with Vanguard newspaper. But look at that picture. You can't miss it. World record to be a Moussin. Well, yeah, so she's got $100,000 uh, for that. Feet, huge feet, and so on. Way to go. So, of course, there'll be a lot of more narrative as this progresses, but beautiful images to see that indeed. So, a Moussin, world champion, record breaker. That's what you see right beside that image there. But then, a lot of focus on Abuja. Abuja Kaduna train kidnapped families of 41 victims, protest, ground transport ministry, block entrance gate, blast first lady for saying nothing, doing nothing. Recall patients Jonathan's famous, there is God though, lamentation, as terrorists demand 4.1 billion naira to free abductees. Yes, you heard it. 4.1 billion naira. How much is the budget of some states? No, really. I mean, oh gosh. How did we get here for them to demand 4.1 billion? You know what it is when you want to cut on the figures. You, the attending range you call, you know you've been in that realm. You know, you can play around that area. But 4.1 billion? And then you hear, you see, give me time to intervene, new minister pleads. Government negotiators in Bush for three weeks. Okay. Let's subscribe to the PermSec. Oh, all right. But the families didn't you know, get this information, did they? And then you see, uh, terrorists release four more victims. Autumn Niger to Mohammed, ACF, CNG, Berate, FG. Everyone. Even government benefits from insecurity, ascribed to Abu Sani, bandit kingpin, says killings in Zavara is tribal war. You never knew that, did you? So, uh, this is a perspective that we get a lot of wagging concerning what's been going on here. Uh, authorities never gave you that indication, and so when they kept on coming up with all of these measures, this bait. Wasn't that there for a lot of people who kept on following government communication about some of these things? You know, so I, I think, leaves more questions. Yeah, I think I recall the president at some point saying that you know, you know, people killing each other. They're actually, you know, from the same area. I think I think I recall he was making that statement at some point. That, I mean, it's the same people essentially killing each other. And you know, a lot of people were wondering, are you talking about the inter-ethnic 
wars or you're talking about the banditry or the terrorism we're seeing. So perhaps this was what he was talking about. And then when about. they now added the no-fly zone, you thought, no-fly zone? On, yeah. What's it got to do with this? So there's a lot. Okay, you know, really. that, that, that's a new dimension when you consider that, you know, initially the thinking was that uh, the insurgency in Zampara State, or the banditry as the case may be now, is as a result of the gold mm. there. The, you know, bandits are profiting from the gold. So I think they're but different levels, that, that, really. Yeah. So now that we hear about the tribal dimension, well... So there's a lot going on there. I don't forget... Uh, well, uh, you can flip to the back page. Vanguard Sports. Amosor leaves the world seething with envy over shoes. <laughs> And Musa gets whooping 112 million naira for winning gold world record. So, and then look at that. A Jamaican applauds and Musa for speaking things into existence as Williams. And so, quite interesting <laughs> to see that. So, uh, that's Vanga today. You know, it was a tweet, it was pinned oh, yeah. on a Twitter handle. She spoke it into existence. Oh, yes. It was later people caught on to this. By the way, the shoes are legal. Okay, she won that race. Okay, she was first and she broke the world record. So I don't get all of the back and forth. world champion. Absolutely. It was, it was, it was uh, heartwarming to see how she powered her yes. to the finish line in that race. If I let me rub this in more <laughs> with the front page of the Nigerian Tribune, in case you thought you've seen the last of it, I uh, think again, it's the front page of the Nigerian Tribune. The picture there, world champion, Nigeria's Toby Amouchon. I know there's been... <laughs> I heard one of the commentators say, Amazon, <laughs> Toby Amazon. I was Daddy, like, no. <laughs> he's forgiven. That commentator is forgiven. Whatever they call it. Because we got the gold. <laughs> Let's go they on. What? Well, she's an Amazon anyway. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> Toby Amushan posing with her world record at the 2022 World Athletes Championship in Oregon, U.S. Uh, yesterday. So, um, you see, next to that, how Ijebode born Amushan became world record holder. Buhari, governors, others celebrate her. So that's one of the big stories. But um, something you may have missed, what we've been keeping tabs on this one, reported this for you actually. Terrorists cause panic in Abuja. Angel 3 Guards Brigade soldiers, FG shots school. I need to underline the fact that that's Abuja, the nation's capital, right there. It's a page 26 read. Host of riders, terrorists, ambush guards brigade in Abuja. Signal hints law school as possible target. FG shots unity school, evacuates students as bandits attack community near school. Family lays siege to Ministry of Transport. And that's the picture under Tobia Mushan's picture you see there. And I need to point this out. Law school, federal government college, Kuali. Clearly, this is a pointed attack on education and we've seen this time and again it looks like it is not ending anytime so they said schools are soft targets and all of that but and, and there's a lot of thing about federal institutions these days don't exactly. forget fgc buniadi now uh Quali. fgc Quali also targeted three guards brigade that's they're going to the presidency now so yeah. um wow this is big you know, there was a lot of talk about how the security of uh, the fct was now threatened following the attack on the Kuji correctional center it's a no -brainer. little wonder that we're, we're hearing this it's a no-brainer uh, by the way there's something big happening today nlc begins pro acid protest today we'll be giving you the details about that live coverage on the show today that's the nigerian tribune mm. i can't recover from tobia mushan's victory and Malpe, uh, uh, it's our celebration really because tobia mushan is a woman. Wait, I'm no, sure you're going to no, talk about no. that you later. You can't spell a woman without a man. Okay, so it is our solution. All right. Let's, let's share it now, I beg. Yeah, yeah. we're sharing it. <laughs> okay, from um, the Nigerian Tribune, let's now go to the Guardian this morning. The Guardian newspapers leads with, you know, that sad story. Sorry to begin that way, but it's inevitable. And it has a harvest of riders. But before we go to the riders, let's take a very quick look at the big story. Terrorist ambush guards brigade in Abuja forces closure of schools. So education is now being affected in Abuja, not just in the northeast and northwestern part of the country as a result of insurgency. Education in Abuja is under threat if this headline is anything to go by. I imagine, you know, children who have to go to school, those in secondary school, the tertiary institutions as well. Uh, the federal government must really do something about it. Let's go to the riders. After 120 days in captivity, four train victims regain freedom. Lead speaker in viral video paid 100 million naira ransom for release, brother claims. Remember, we're going on about whether they paid or they didn't pay. Well, 
If it's anything to go by, you heard it. 100 million naira exchanged hands. Families of trained victims block transportation ministry, condemn Aisha Buhari's silence, demand release of loved ones. Give me time to get briefings, minister pleads, that's the new minister. Government, others benefiting from insecurity, bandit King Ping tells the BBC. You know, that, perhaps another question that one should ask is for those who have been released over time, you know, from the Abuja Kaduna train travelers, were they debriefed? What did they tell security agents uh, about their time in captivity? What did they say about their location? How difficult is it for you know, security agencies to go into the forest to get them? These you mean they don't have that information already? Already, already. I recall uh, perhaps one government official was saying over the weekend that it's rather difficult to go yeah, and bomb, bomb the terrorists the because of the Collateral human interest damage. concern. Yeah. But, but is it difficult to trace the money? But what about How do the they move hundreds of millions? Hundreds of millions, but what about the strategy? Is any strategy being considered? These are questions. Just before we leave the riders, or Tom, uh, well, there's a statement attributed to him. There's no government in Nigeria. 18,000 killed by terrorists between 2020 and 2022, PDP laments. NNPP calls for state of emergency in five states. Northern youth threatened to disrupt 2023 election, general elections if insecurity persists. Well, that's a harvest of riders. You'll find this story on page six of the Guardian newspapers. That's it on the Guardian newspapers this morning. Well, let's look at what Daily Trust has for you this morning. Uh, they too are also focusing on the reality back home. Captain, two soldiers killed after terrorist threat on Abuja Law School. Army confirms attack, says troops coming area. Federal government puts schools on red alert nationwide. FCT schools shut as bandits intensify attacks on Abuja suburbs. Well, it's just as well, because some people will say that, um, you know, the holidays are already here. Um, but I do not know why it is that we have to close schools um, as a result of this. But if we cannot save those who have been abducted, then I think we have to prevent more from being abducted. And if this is the only way we know how, it's, it's really, uh, I don't want to say it's embarrassing. Embarrassing is very mild a word to use for or what is currently going on. It's a shame. It is. But it's better to be safe than sorry. You'll find uh, pictures also of parents and students uh, trying to leave the uh, federal government college, Kuali, uh, right here in Abuja. Uh, you also have the story, train attack, families, Piquet Transport Ministry as three more abductees released. Concerns rise over federal government's funding. Investors shun local bonds. Uh, page 19 is where you find the story. Baker's hike, bread price by 20% and four-day strike. 20 million Nigerians infected with hepatitis B, C, that's according to the federal government. Okada riders to federal government. Nationwide ban may create worst monster. Render 40 million jobless. Uh, you also find this story here. Praise galore for history maker Toby Amushan. It's on page 31 of the paper. Um, I'm going to, you know, investigate that name because I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm thinking that the pronunciation might be different, but let us see. Uh, but in the meantime, let's go with Kayate's pronunciation. Toby Amushan is what he says. Uh, but page 31 is where we'll where you'll find details. Let's leave it there for Daily Trust newspapers. Well, I'd rather focus on the gold medal. Uh, I take a little leadership newspaper next. Uh, you get to see to avert security breach in Abuja, FG closes schools. That's a big one right there. Beef up security in Unity Colleges nationwide. Three soldiers wounded as military repels terrorist attack in FCT. Families of train attack passengers shut down transport ministry. ministry. There will be no election in North without their release. Youths won. BDP calls for a special National Council of State meeting. So all of that you get to see 
on the front page. And then if you remember the statements coming through from uh, Mr. Gabba's show saying the president has done more than is required or expected of him and the military, the army know what is expected of them as well and that they're being professional. So how do you deal with all of that? But um, that's uh, leadership today. Well, Nigeria News Direct focuses on something different entirely. A rebirth, anxiety as victims kick over alleged sack of 500 NMPC staff. Interesting. Offers juicy packages to appease affected staff. Spokesman blocks WhatsApp line of News Direct CEO. So it's a page three read. Uh, that's the focus of Nigeria News Direct uh, this morning. And you just wonder, what is going on? Well, a couple of other stories really on the front page. Um, I just noticed the discrepancy. One of the dailies reporting four released. And, I mean, majority saying three released. I think there was a video that was released again that showed someone different from the people in the picture mm -hmm. that was released. So perhaps that's the math that's be, being, being done. But um, essentially, that's what you find on the front page of uh, Nigerian News Direct uh, this morning, as well as other stories. And uh, very briefly, let's take a look at Daily Independent. Daily Independent goes with Amusho. I'm, I'm confident the correct pronunciation Malpa is Amusho, uh, Ijabudi born. Well, we'll still have to investigate the meaning of the name. She's getting all the attention uh, this morning and for a very long time too. So she's on the front page of uh, Daily Independent this morning. World record. Well, let's look at the big story now. More insurers to go under as regulatory hammer dangles. Well, a look at the insurance sector there. You find that story. Um, well, the font is not so large now, but you, you, you get that story when you pick up Daily Independent. Let's look at other stories. Uh, the train terrorist victims also make the front page. Victims' relatives protest in Abuja block ministry entrance because of release of abducted passengers remains a priority. That's according to the federal government. FGC's improved revenue moderating debt service to revenue ratio. That's on page 29. And... Uh, Let's look at the last one, which now has to do with the economy as well. Budget raises concerns over poor 2022 budget performance. And just one more story before we exit uh, the Daily Independent. That's what's happening today and may form some of our talking points. NLC protests over ASU Sanu Nasu strike begin. NLC protest that would be over ASU Sanu Nasu strike begins today. So. We are to see how that will play out this morning. That's the Daily Independent for you. Well, New Telegraph has this worsening insecurity panic in FCT as terrorists ambush injured Gad's brigade soldiers. Abuja Law School, others targeted. Federal government orders closure of FGC Kwali, beefs up security in Unity Colleges. ROI youths, we won't allow political campaigns in our region unless and demand Mongono's resignation. There is no government in Nigeria, or Tom confirms fresh influx of aliens into Benue. Over 18,000 Nigerians killed in two years, as according to the PDP, calls for special council of state meeting. Uh, pages 2, 3, and 4 will give you the stories there. Uh, look at this. ASU strike, NLC to start three-day warning strike, vows total commitment to plan protest. Uh, pages 8 and 30 is where you'll find details. Obi, why I didn't inform Atiku before leaving PDP? Says he'll fix, improve security, economy, if elected. Uh, you also find a number of other stories just beneath the nameplate, but uh, uh, oh yes, and they have they also have the story on Amushan, since the Jebode people say that's how it is pronounced. 2022 World Championship Gold. I tell you that she's Nigerian, as Nigerian as can be. God showed up to crown my effort. That's according to the celebrant there, the star girl Amushan. Buhari Kalu celebrate win. You'll find all the details on page 31. And uh, just in case you're wondering, export grant federal government earmarks 375 billion naira for 288 firms. Let's leave it there for New Telegraph.
Yeah, so there you go. That wraps it up with a look at some of the dailies here today. We will be back in a moment. Stay with us. To the electoral act where the, uh, the, the this thing says in section 31 that where a candidate withdraws and then in section 33 then that you have to you know what you need to do where a candidate withdraws in section 33 that you have to within 14 days and that's what the party did that within 14 days they complied and notified INEC and INEC came and they observed the election so now the judge relied on the 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 the, the, the lie told by and by saying, look, I was not aware that the candidate has withdrawn. And it's not for you to be aware, because you have to rely on the, uh, the Electoral Act. And so the party, you know, uh, uh, published in the constituency, look, there will be another election on ninth, And that election held. And uh, the same Anne, incidentally, was in the party secretariat when that decision was taken. And there were cameras everywhere that captured her even when she was signing. And uh, she, so for me, she lied on that oath. And the PD, uh, APC in Ebony State, they have taken it up to sue, you know, to say, look, you lied on that oath. But the court did not disqualify me. The court says that there should be a rerun. And the both of them, whether they have withdrawn or not, should be given the opportunity to also try again. Well, all of the off-season elections which need to be conducted has now been conducted by the Independent National Electoral Commission to the applause of many citizens. Uh, but the questions now as to how INEC itself is getting ready for the 2023 elections. Yesterday, a story in one of the dailies, uh, particularly the Vanguard, talked about how uh, there is tension in INEC and infighting, which is threatening the 2023 elections. A lot of it bordering on this issue of, of qualification of some candidates or would-be candidates or purported candidates who did not participate in the primaries. And according to some, the selective um, implementation of the Electoral Act with regards to this we have uh, right here with us in the studio, Mr. Festa Sokoye, who is a National Commissioner and Chairman Information and Voter Education Committee at INEC to shed a little more light uh, and clarify what precisely is going on. Good morning and welcome to Sunrise Daily, sir. Yeah, good morning. Well, that was uh, the, the track which we just played is that of the Boeing State Governor, um, Governor Dave Omahi, who was talking about uh, the story which we heard on Friday. The news we received was that, was that he was disqualified by the courts um, over certain sections which were irregular with, his, with regards to his participation in the uh, 2023 elections. Uh, but yesterday, he was clear in the air that no, he wasn't 
uh, disqualified. He said disqualification is a different term to use and that the terms for qualification are clearly spelled out by the Electoral Act. Let us ask, ask you, what exactly is the stance of INEC with regards to the participation or the senatorial ambition um, of Governor Dave Omahi? Well, uh, we, we have not been served with the judgment uh, uh, referenced uh, uh, by, the, by the governor himself. Uh, when we are served with that particular judgment, we will look at the main trust of the judgment, and then we take a decision relating to the main trust of um, uh, the judgment. But all I know is that if in an election the person who won the party nomination withdraws from the race, it is now the responsibility of the political party to forward the letter of withdrawal together with an affidavit sworn to by the candidate who has withdrawn to the effect that I am no longer interested in, um, in proceeding with this particular race. And then thereafter, the political party that did the nomination will go back and conduct uh, a fresh uh, primary within a period of 14 days from the date of the occurrence of the, of the event. But, but I, I think that uh, there's a, a slight uh, 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 issue with uh, the um, one of the governor. This is because if there has been a party primary and a candidate has been, uh, one of the aspirants has been defeated, the aspirant that has been defeated doesn't need to withdraw anymore. In, in, other, in other words, it is the candidate that won the party primaries that can withdraw uh, from, uh, fr from the race, not the candidate that has been defeated. The candidate that has been defeated in a party primary does not withdraw from, from, from a party primary. It is the candidate that won the party primaries that can withdraw. And so I think that um, when we see the judgment of, of, of court, uh, some of these things will become uh, clearer, and then the commission will take a stand and make a decision uh, relating to, uh, to his own issue. What exactly is the crux of them? I mean, I know that INEC must have been joined in this suit. Is that correct? <laughs> Uh, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm aware that INEC has been joined. So what exactly is the, is the kernel of the matter in which INEC has been joined in this suit? I, I, I think, from, from my own perspective, the, uh, His Excellency, the Governor of Ebony State, went to uh, the Federal High Court uh, to compel the Independent National Electoral Commission uh, to publish his name as uh, the senatorial candidate of the party in his own senatorial district. I think that that is a uh, cross of the matter. And then thereafter... Why have I, you refused to publish his name? Uh, no. Um, there, were, there were issues mm -hmm. relating to the publication of his name. Mm -hmm. uh, but some of those issues uh, uh, had already been clarified uh, by the commission. Um, the period for given to the commission by the Electoral Act uh, for the display uh, of the names of uh, 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 nominated candidates had already elapsed. Uh, so, uh, and he had made available to the commission certain documents uh, relating to uh, what happened or what transpired during the uh, party, party primaries. Uh, so, uh, the commission was waiting uh, for the period for the publication of the final list of candidates uh, for us to take a decision relating to the submissions uh, he had made. Uh, but he went to the Federal High Court to compel uh, the commission to, um, uh, to publish his name. And that was exactly what, what transpired. Mm. Now, we understand that right now. I mean, I think INEC also was the one who said that uh, you have over 300 cases uh, pending in court as a result of the primaries that has been conducted by many political parties. Is that correct? Yes. Um, and for a number of people, uh, from what we hear, from what we understand, that some of this... Um, uh, cases have been caused by how INEC itself has conducted itself, ignoring the reports of, of the INEC at the state level um, and not exactly following the reports as produced by the INEC, which monitored, I know INEC is one, but, so it's a little, by the state INEC, which monitored primaries across political parties. Is that correct? Let, 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 me, let me just say this. I'm say it very clearly and unequivocally. If you look at the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, which is the ground norm, the commission is made up of the chairman, who is the chief electoral uh, commissioner of the federation, and 12 national commissioners. These are the ones that the Constitution refers to as the commission. Now, resident electoral commissioners are not the commission. The powers 
given to national commissioners and the chairman of the commission are delegated to the resident electoral commissioners. In other words, resident electoral commissioners act in a delegated capacity. So if we do not delegate powers to a resident electoral commissioner, a resident electoral commissioner will not have powers to act. Furthermore, when a resident electoral commissioner is appointed, the commission sways in, the chairman of the commission sways in the resident electoral commissioner, and the resident electoral commissioner is assigned responsibilities by the commission. In other words, he goes to represent the commission, which is the chairman and 12 national commissioners. We also have electoral officers in the 774 local government areas of the Federation. All of them carry out the intendment and carry out the functions of the commission as represented by the chairman and the national commissioners. Now, when an issue emerges, it is when party primaries are called, the under section 82, it is to the chairman that the letter by the political party signifying his intention to conduct party primaries goes to. The letter goes to the chairman? It goes to the chairman of the commission, who now means the letter to the director in charge of election and party monitoring. And then the, the director in charge of election and party monitoring, together with other directors, now plan the monitoring of the party primaries. Now, the party primaries are conducted by the National Executive Committee of the political party not the state chapters of the political parties. Now, when party primaries are conducted and reports are submitted to the commission, to the commission now, the commission looks at several, several variables. There are some party primaries, let, let, let me just give you an example. If, for instance, we receive a report that a political party did not conduct party primaries, there is no way we can publish the list and personal particulars of whoever purportedly emerged from that party, uh, uh, so-called party primaries. That is within the realm of the commission itself and within the powers granted to the commission under section uh, 29 of the Electoral Act and section 84 of the Electoral Act. If, for instance, a political party uh, 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 moves to go and conduct party primaries and a candidate emerges from that party primaries and then the party whose responsibility it is to upload the list of validly nominated candidates nominates a different candidate. The commission is not under any legal or constitutional obligation to publish such a name. If a state, if, if, um, if the commission has monitored party primaries and within the intervening period, there's a court order saying, don't accept this particular list, accept the other list. It is within the realm of the commission to do the needful. So, so a, 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 um, um, the fact that party primaries has been monitored does not ipso facto mean that we must accept the report, no matter the circumstances, which, even, even if there's a court which order to the are, contrary. Which reports are you referring to now? No, 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 no. I'm, I'm not referring... Let, let me give you a... a you say it, is, it doesn't mean that you, have, you must accept the report. Which report are you referring to? Let, let, let me give you a, a practical example. For, for, for instance, in relation uh, to the uh, party primaries relating to the senior president uh, in Yobe State, there was a report to the effect that party primaries was conducted and somebody won the election. Whose report? That's the INEC report? INEC report. Okay. That's what I wanted to yes, clarify. Yes, the INEC report. Yes. But the party whose responsibility it is to submit the name of the validly nominated candidate submitted the name of a different candidate. And the commission did not publish the name of any candidate in relation to that particular uh, party primaries. This is because if you look at section 29, subsection 1 of the Electoral Act, it says that a political party shall submit the list of candidates it intends to sponsor who have, must have emerged from valid party primaries. It didn't say that the commission should submit. It is the responsibility of the political parties to do so. Secondly, in the case of Delta State, for instance, the, the, the commission monitored party primaries. A candidate emerged from that party primaries. The, 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 the political party submitted the name of a candidate they believe won the party primaries. One of the aspirants went to court, and the court said, no, you are the candidate. The PDP and the Independent National Electoral Commission should do the needful and, and submit your name. 
Then what, what the commission did was that we received this court order. We now wrote to the PDP as a political party saying, look, this is the judgment of the court. The court says a so-so and so person won the party primaries. Please upload the name uh, or the list and personal particulars of the candidate that the court said won the party primaries. They have not done so. So it is the responsibility of the party mm. under Section 29 to do the needful. Well, there will be many questions about that. Let me flip this to Lagos. I'm glad that some of the examples are already coming up. I guess they'll have questions on those examples as well. Ladies oh, yes, and gentlemen. We will, but we'd like to just quickly just get some clarification about what you started out with in the uh, South senatorial election, where you say that um, it is a candidate who has won that can withdraw. The person who didn't win cannot withdraw. So what is the position of... So does it mean that those letters circulating, that the candidate who didn't win, who was second, withdrew, that letter doesn't amount to anything, and she is still in it as it stands now? <laughs> you know, you know I, I, think, I, think that the, I think that the issues are very, very simple, and the issues are very, very clear. If there has been a contest between two, indi two individuals, and at the end of the day, one person won clearly the party primaries. The person who did not win, the person who did not, who was defeated, cannot withdraw from a contest in which he or she has been defeated. So, so I, uh, uh, at a personal level, I don't know the basis for, on which somebody who was defeated in a party primary election can withdraw. Uh, so that is within the realm of the political parties. I, don't, I'm, I cannot stay here and then uh, um, uh, um, speculate on what transpired uh, within the political party itself on how a candidate that was defeated and a candidate that won uh, withdrew from, 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 from the race. It's possible that it is within the internal dynamics of the political party, but I'm not in a position uh, to speculate on what, on what happened. But all I know is that a candidate that was defeated in a party primary elections cannot withdraw from a race in which, in which he or she has been defeated. So the question there will be, can an aspirant now, because I know that there's now de clear definitions yeah. of aspirant and candidate, can an aspirant or a person who did not participate in the original primaries, can the person now, you know, take up the withdrawal of the candidates, if you get what I mean? Because we've seen primaries, essentially they withdraw for people who are in the race at that time. So can someone who was not in the race at the at the time the primary was taking place, can the person now come standing or at least take the place of the candidate who won that then withdrew? Well, the, the moment there has been a withdrawal, the implication is that nothing has happened and the implication is that the political party has a clean slate, in which case any individual belonging to that particular political party, belonging to the uh, uh, senatorial district or state constituency uh, or governorship uh, 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 um, uh, um, constituency, can participate in such a party primary because the original candidate uh, who participated in the party primary uh, is no longer there. And le let, me, let me just give you a practical example. If, for instance, there was only one candidate um, in a particular um, uh, a senatorial district uh, who came in through a process of consensus, and then immediately after the party primaries, uh, through which the person emerged through a process of consensus, the, pe the person withdraws, uh, the implication is that there is no individual um, uh, who contested with him. So in that, in that instance, in that circumstance, uh, the party can throw the race open to every other individual who is, inter who is interested, and that particular individual uh, can participate in that particular process. But and Mr. that Koye, is the position of the law. Whatever happened to Section 115 that talks about, uh, you know, a candidate uh, signing another nomination or result from, in, uh, you know, another election in a constituency, something to that effect. Uh, what does, how does that come into play, especially for those who had you know, picked up forms for a particular office, lost out, then picked up another nomination form for another office entirely? It doesn't, it doesn't come into play at all. It doesn't, uh, it, it, the, 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 all, the, all the analysis and all the, uh, um, uh, 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 issues that have been canvassed relating to Section 115 doesn't come into play. And I say this advisedly. This is because 
as at the time people are participating in party primaries, they are participating in party primaries at a domestic level, at the level of their various political parties. And under Section 152 of the Electoral Act 2022, uh, they are aspirants, people who aspire to various positions in their political parties. They are not candidates. Even under Section 29, Subsection 1, when a political party is submitting a li the list, the, part, uh, the political party is submitting the list of candidates it intends to sponsor. But Mr. Who Koye, must have why does from the valid party primary? Why does the law and then use? Why, pardon me. Why does the, the law then use is, nomination form? What is the essence of nomination no, form for a, candidates? Isn't that no, for no, an just a minute. The party? I, I, I will clarify that. Okay. I will clarify that. I will clarify that. The point I'm making is that under Section 29, Subsection 1, the list and personal particulars which the political parties submit to the Independent National Electoral Commission is incorrect. And that is why Section 29, Subsection 2 says that the Independent National Electoral Commission shall, within seven days of the receipt of these personal particulars, publish them in the constituency in which the candidate intends to contest the election. And then members, uh, uh, um, any aspirant who believes that uh, any of the information submitted by the aspirant in relation to his or her constitutional qualification to contest is not right can go to court. Now, thereafter, thereafter, the commission will give to each political party to give to their candidates who have emerged from valid party primaries what we call from EC13A to E. EC13A is nomination form for presidential election. EC13B is nomination form for governorship election. EC13C relates to senatorial election. EC13D relates to House of Representatives. And E relates to State Assembly. It is these nomination forms that have not been filled that the candidates will now fill and then um, register voters in their constituency will, constituencies will also fill. So that is the nomination form Section 115D uh, uh, is, is, talking, is talking about. The, those who contested presidential primaries and whose names have been submitted have up to the 8th day of August uh, 2022 to submit these nomination forms. And for those who contested for governorship election and state assembly election, they have up to the 18th day of August uh, 2022 to submit these nomination forms, which we call from EC 13A to E. So the nomination forms have not been submitted. Every other thing that happened relates to the internal affair of political parties and not the nomination that Section 115 of the Electoral Act is talking about. Um, similar negotiations like that of Governor Mahi, where his brother won the election and then withdrew so that he could replace him, are ongoing, particularly with National Assembly candidates who lost out election and then a pseudo candidate to stand on their behalf in another party which they may now take up uh, following their loss. If there is a, a spirit of the law, apart from the letter of the law, isn't the purpose of Section 115, hasn't it been defeated in this case now, where there is um, an option, a negotiation option for somebody to stand in their place if they have lost a particular election, then they can now uh, pick up uh, you know, the, the, the choice of one who has stood in for them? No, the spirit you are talking about is the spirit of the internal dynamics within the various political parties, the spirit of internal party democracy uh, within the various um, uh, political parties, and also the, what I may call the spirit of opportunism uh, within some of the political parties where people um, uh, uh, place in pseudo candidates and then wait to see what happens within their own political parties, whether they will uh, get the nomination or not. And if they don't get the nomination, they simply walk across uh, uh, another political party and then go and replace a, a pseudo candidate uh, that they have already positioned. And so the implication, and what we are now saying, is that we have to find ways and means of strengthening our political parties so that they can become political parties in the true sense of the word. Political parties that share a certain level of ideology, political parties that are based. Uh, 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 you know, on, on set principles um, and clearly defined um, ideological position. Uh, so I believe that um, 
Um, we have to keep on working on our political party process, keep on working on our laws to make sure uh, that at least political parties conform to the letter and spirit of the uh, constitution and the letter and spirit of the, of, the, of the Electoral Act. But as I said, yes, the Section 82 and Section 84 uh, of the Electoral Act has set out clear, clear guidelines on how people will emerge in party primaries. But it is also the responsibility of the political parties at their own domestic level uh, to make sure that they observe internal party democracy and, uh, and um, uh, 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 do their things in a very clearly defined ma manner, rather than um, allowing people to move from one political party to the other uh, at will. Mr. Okay, can Section 21 of the Electoral Act 29, sorry, override Section 28514B and C of the 1999 Constitution with regards to accepting nominations from uh, elect for, for the primaries, really? understand that the Independent National Electoral Commission is a creation of the Constitution and also a creation of the law. They also understand the fact that we have our regulations and guidelines uh, through which we do our things. Before, um, before this particular period, uh, political parties nominate or, or forward the list and personal particulars of their nominated candidates uh, uh, manually or physically, and they throw these things to the Independent National Electoral Commission. And sometimes um, the, the, national, the national headquarters of the political party will bring in a list and personal particulars. The state branch will bring in a list and personal particulars. Factions will bring in lists and personal particulars, and there will be fights at the premises of the Independent National Electoral Commission. Well, but we have utilized technology, and then we have given an access code to the national chairman of each of the registered political parties, with which they upload the list and personal particulars of their nominated candidates to our candidates' nomination portal. So we don't have any physical interaction with the political parties at this point in time. Well, I completely yeah. agree yeah. that under, under Section 285 of the, of the, of the Constitution, yeah. the Independent National Electoral Commission yeah. is under a constitutional obligation uh, to give effect to the orders of properly constituted courts of law. But in, the instance, in, in, the, in this particular instance, mm -hmm. the, 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 the judge was categorical that the political party involved and the Independent National Electoral Commission shall accept the list uh, or, or the nomination of a particular candidate. So what the commission has done in compliance with the court order is to say, yes, we rec recognize this court order. It is a valid court order. It's a genuine court order. We now wrote to the, to the political party that we have received this particular court order. Please comply with this court order by using the access code we have given to you and upload the list, the name of the candidate that the court says is the valid candidate into our candidate's nomination portal. So we have complied with our own portion of the court order. It is now left for the political party to also comply with their own portion so, of the court order so by complying with the intendment of the law and the, and the, and the, and the order that was given by, so, by the court. So if, we have complied. We can, so if we can put it dif this way, and perhaps simply, under the 2022 Electoral Act and then the 285 of the Constitution, INEC has powers to reject nominations sent to them by parties or candidates who did not emerge from valid primaries. That's the way it is, isn't it? Yes. Okay. So what is going on with some of these states? Because we, as is being published there, that um, it appears as though some of the states, the recs, submitted lists of persons who emerged from valid primaries, and I didn't accept some of those names because they see in some cases 26 were submitted, only two were accepted. They don't know why some of the others were not accepted. So what is going on in that regard? Let, let, let me just say this clearly, that that report is just uh, what I call imaginative speculation. The Independent National Electoral Commission has no division. In fact, as of today, most of the national commissioners are in the states that they supervise, trying to make sure that we finish strong with the issue of the uh, continuous voters registration exercise. Secondly, I have pointed out, some of the court orders are served on the commission directly. So in one of the instances, the court 
said we should monitor the party primaries that was conducted by a state chapter of the political party. And we went ahead in compliance with the court order to go and monitor that party primaries. But the national office of the, of the political party involved uh, went ahead and monitored and conducted a different party primary. By the time lists were being submitted, the political party involved submitted the name of the candidate that emerged from their own party primaries, which was supervised and conducted by the national uh, uh, headquarters of the party. And then during the interval, there was also a court order from the Court of Appeal saying, oh, that it is the candidates that emerged from the one that was conducted by the national office that are the valid candidates. So we weigh all these variables uh, in terms of um, uh, our party uh, uh, monitoring report, uh, our, our monitoring reports in coming to a, a, a decision. It is the Independent National Electoral Commission that com comes into a, a decision relating uh, to what to do going forward, taking into consideration all the variables involved, taking into consideration court orders and taking into consideration uh, what has happened in terms of our having been given notice or not been given notice. Uh, so we have been fair, we have been uh, courageous, and we have also um, uh, uh, looked at the justice of the case and taken decisions that are in the best interest of this country and in the best interest of our electoral democracy. Well, you say that there is no tension within INEC. Is, is that what you're saying? This tension, I, we, we, I'm, I'm saying that national commissioners are not even around for there to be any tension in the, in the, in the, in the, in the just a minute. And you know, we just came out from the Kitty governorship election. We just came out from the Oshun, Oshun governorship election. As at the time we were in Oshun conducting the Oshun governorship election, the nominations were ongoing. And national commissioners, we have just been... I, I'm just clarifying yes. that because, you know, when you opened your statement, you're talking about who the commission is yes. and how there is, a, there is a, uh, the chairman of the commission and 12 national commissioners. Yes. And you are saying that the powers of the national commissioners are delegated to the RECs. Yes. Uh, but uh, it looks like section, uh, or let me look at this now, uh, a provision of the Constitution, which is the third schedule, paragraph 14 of the 1999 Constitution, talks about how there shall be for each state of the Federation and the Federal Capital Territory, Abuja, a resident electoral commissioner yes. who shall be appointed by the president, be persons of unquestionable integrity and not be less than 35 years of age. And it's under the same uh, section where the Independent National Electro Electoral Commission is also mentioned. Yes. No, no. If, if you look, you have to begin to read from, from 14. It says the Independent National Electoral Commission shall comprise the following members. Indeed. A chairman who shall be the chief electoral commissioner and 12 other members to be known as national electoral commissioners. Mm -hmm. And then when you flip over, you will see to 15, it says the commission shall have power to. No, just a moment. Before you say the commission. Yes. It also says a member of the commission as subsection 2. Yes. A member of the commission shall then you now have the other stipulations. Yes. Um, a, be nonpartisan, a person of unquestionable integrity, be not less than 40 years. There shall be for each state. So it does seem that, in, that they are also recognized as members of the commission, no, as no, the no, resident no, electoral no, commission. No, they are not recognized as members of the commission because if you flip through and you go to, uh, to 15H, 15, 15, uh, uh, it says that the commission shall have power to delegate any of his powers to any resident electoral commissioner. That's the point I'm making. The Constitution says that the commission shall be the chairman and 12 national commissioners. And this commission shall have power to delegate any of, any of his powers to a resident electoral commissioner. So, so there is no dispute I, I'm just whatsoever a, I'm, 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 Do you know why yes. I'm, I'm a little curious that you have raised that distinction first? I mean, it was yes. the first thing which you signposted. Yes. It was almost like as if you were trying to make distinctions that, you know, maybe the recs who are complaining right now or wherever it is that this tension is coming from, you know, should know their place with regards to where the chairman of the commission is and the national commissioners. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not aware that any resident electoral commissioner is complaining, but I'm trying to clarify issues relating to whether the commission is bound under any circumstance to accept the monitoring report that has emerged from any resident electoral commissioner. This is because if a resident electoral commissioner has been directed by the commission 
to monitor a particular party primaries. And the resident electoral commissioner has submitted the report. And within the intervening period, there is a court order saying, don't uh, uh, accept that monitoring report or the report emanating from that particular uh, party primaries that you monitored. Accept that, uh, accept the report from a different party primary. I'm saying that the commission as a commission has the power and the right to take that decision without reference to the resident electoral commissioner who, has, who must have monitored that particular uh, party primaries in question. That's the point I'm making. Well, we're totally out of time. Uh, I do not know whether you did see the Vanguard report. Did I, you see, I, I did. You saw the Vanguard I, report. I did, do yes. you want to explain what happened in Kano? where it was seen that the primaries that was conducted and the person who emerged winner is different from the, from the name that was published? That, 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 I've, I've made that point, that the, there was a court order to the effect that we should monitor a particular party primary organized by the state chapter of the, of the party. The national headquarters of the party did not participate in that particular one. Rather, they went, organized a different party primaries um, and, uh, and um, uh, wrote their own report in relation to that party, party primary. Did INEC monitor that one? No, the, the commission did not monitor that particular one. Now, it is that one that the national recognized that they, they uploaded the name to our, our, our portal. I'm saying that within the intervening period, there were some other court judgments that intervened. Uh, but when I get to the office, I'm going to clarify much more clearly whether it was the Court of Appeal judgment uh, that intervened within that intervening period that led to our accepting the list and publishing the list that was submitted by the national headquarters of the political party uh, uh, itself. So what is your assurance to resident electoral commissioners? Um, you know, I know that you have re released a statement before now yes. saying that you stand by the reports of your resident electoral commissioners. But for those of them who have any worry whatsoever, wondering if their work has gone to waste, uh, what do you have to say to them? No, 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 no. Uh, this it is not every party primaries that a resident electoral commissioner monitors. We monitor party primaries across, across board. Some of the monitors are even sent from the national headquarters to go and join them in, in, in the states. But my assurance is that there is no division in the commission. All the national commissioners and resident electoral commissioners and electoral officers are working towards the same goal. We are unequivocally committed to the 2020 regional election, and we are working to make sure that we give Nigerians a very good election in 2023. Well, we have to thank you so much for your time this morning. Uh, we've been speaking with uh, Mr. Festus Okoye, who is a national commissioner and also chairman information and virtual education Com committee um, at INEC. Thank you so much for coming on Sunrise Today this morning. Thank you so much. Welcome back. Well, that is what we're focusing on next, the solidarity protest by ASU. But hold on, take a look at this, because already here in Lagos, it gets around about those are live images of where they are converging. They'll kick off from there and then move on to other areas. So that's where unions are converging for this solidarity protest, ASU and labor and as you can see the security men are already there the unionists are also already there so there's a lot that we will expect from this protest not just in lagos in different parts of the country as well but you know what does this imply when will the end is it just today what's the implication of this what about government's perspective saying well, they don't, they don't, there's no dispute, so why will uh, uh, Labour join with this protest? So, which other unions will be joining this? What do we expect out of ordinary Nigerians? If I road users, who will hit the road? How will this affect things? Well, to share some light on this matter and then talk us through what to expect, we'll head to Abuja, the president of Nigeria Labour Congress. is sitting right there with Mark Bay. 
Thank you, Chamberlain. Indeed, uh, Comrade Ayuba Waba is here as president of the Nigeria Labour Congress. A lot of questions uh, which Chamberlain has already started asking you. Uh, but let us, you know, I know that there's been a lot of questions as to whether or not this is legal. Some people say it's not about whether or not it is legal. It's about whether or not it is moral. Um, you, have, you have given sufficient notice about this particular protest. And today, it will seem that, you know, from the pictures that we can see, you're going ahead with it. Can you tell us why you have decided to join uh, the Academic Staff Union of Universities on this particular strike action? Not joining. I think uh, there have been some misconstruction of the information. Um, all the five unions, or let me say four unions, are affiliates of the Nigerian Labour Congress. SANU, NASU, NAT, and ASU. And all their membership are membership of, are members of the NLC. NLC don't have direct members except members of their affiliates. So it's not about solidarity. It's something that we wear the shoe, it pinches us, and we are responding to the issue. The issue in dispute is quite clear. It should be a matter of concern to every Nigerian that our Nigerian universities have been closed down for five months. And the children of the poor, and particularly the working class, are at home. Why the children of the rich and the elites are graduating daily from foreign universities and they have the audacity to post those pictures to all of us. It, is, it was Mandela that said that the best way to address the issue of inequality in our society and address poverty is to give the children of the poor quality education. That is why we are actually responding. And a lot of effort has been made by the NLC in the, in the past five months including several letters, including uh, 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 pre-warning letters to say that this issue, if action is not taken, it may result to A, B, C, D. Mm. Every so, agency of government have received our letter. We had three national executive council meetings where decisions were taken. In some cases, we tarried the decision to allow for peace to prevail. But in all of this, we have not seen any solution in sight. Have you joined the negotiation that has been ongoing between ASU and the federal government? In this yes, instance? the last meeting which was prompted by the NLC, mm -hmm. where we wrote directly to Mr. President through the Chief of Staff to say that can we scale up this conversation to a higher level? And that meeting was actually converged uh, in, uh, I think, 12th of April, chaired by the Chief of Staff and all the relevant agencies and the unions were there. It was government that requested for six months, six weeks uh, adjournment to be able to receive the report of the BRICS committee, uh, to be able to do integrity tests on some of the platforms recommended uh, for payment and other issues. And therefore, since then, there was no meeting. Mm. So from what you have seen, um, is it that, you know, that there is no will to resolve the dispute? Or would you say that there is a, um, maybe there is, government is unable to, maybe as a result of paucity of funds? Uh, first, I can say there is unnecessary delay. Uh, because I think whatever you can do today, why must you wait for five months? And we're destroying the future of these youths. In fact, yesterday I traveled to you. On my way back, I met a woman, Fry Nakra, and, and, uh, and, uh, and Yam. She said it is from the proceeds that she has been sponsoring her children in the university. And now they are at home. She felt depressed. This is the situation everywhere. Because parents are really, really depressed, but importantly, the children. Being at home for five months, we have lost the academic calendar already. And time lost certainly cannot be gained. So I think there should be some level of urgency in the whole issue. I remembered in the past, particularly in 2011, because the 29 agreement that uh, uh, have been a subject matter, 2009 agreement that have been the subject matter, in fact, the implementation took effect clearly in 2011, when we are in such a dispute. At the highest level, I remembered, President Jonathan invited NLC and all the unions and for 12, 14 hours, there was a meeting, the issue was resolved. Because some of those issues need to be scaled to the highest level. And even if it's about the paucity of funds, we will look at the issues. And I'm sure all the unions are also unions that are very, very considerate. Because the economic situation is also very, very bad. And basically, we cannot retain our best. 
when I was looking at the statistics yesterday and the exchange rate going for 670 naira to the dollar, I realized that none of our professors, none, and you can confirm, receive up to $700. It's not possible. I was on a board with a professor yesterday. He said he's living. He cannot survive in this economy. Uh, he worked to earn a living. He needs to take care of his family. Things are going nowhere. And therefore, basically, with $700, he cannot survive. So we cannot also attract the best into our educational system in the past. You find out that we attract the best. Mm. So what exactly is this protest? You, you've said it's not a strike. What exactly is this protest meant to achieve if today? The protest first is to show our concern and also call for urgent action to resolve the issues. We took two levels of decision. First is the national protest to call for attention and for the issue to be resolved promptly. And the next level is three days national warning strike. If nothing has happened, after the uh, protest to uh, actually show our grievances, and uh, these are uh, democratic norms everywhere around the world, even as an individual, you have the right to hear your grievances. It's within the provision of our law. It's backed by UN Charter for Human and People's Rights, African Charter for Human and People's Rights. It's there in our constitution, section 3940, and even the courts have pronounced okay, that so you don't require any permission. So it's legal, it's within your fundamental right to protest in issues. And even you remember within COVID, even with the challenge of COVID, with the global public health emergency, that right has not been taken away from any citizen. Citizens protest, even within COVID, you see it around the world. It, because it's a fundamental right. So it's legal. So when people say it's illegal or it's... it's and uh, I think people should also remember, no condition is permanent. I can tell you very soon, we'll be actually launching the uh, NLC at 40 document. You have pictures there, particularly page 85, where you have our current political elites joining NLC in similar action in the past to try to press for action to address some of those fundamental issues of development. Mm. Let me flip this to Lagos now. Uh, thank you, Mark. Well, I just want to follow up on one of the questions she asked, and that's uh, from at least part of the negotiations which you have witnessed and at least have an insight into. What, what sense are you getting? Are you getting a sense that indeed government has the capacity, the funds, the money to solve this problem because money is actually at the heart of all of this really so do you get a sense that indeed government has money or can actually try to and it isn't or or what exactly and we need to get that point clear no uh, it's not everything that is about money yes money is involved but importantly like uh, the issue of uh, the platform that is being used uh, to pay uh, the university workers and even the uh, civil service uh, the ips which has uh, come under scrutiny, and uh, also uh, it has been part of the challenge. Uh, it does not require money. Uh, two, also, I can tell you that we are not a poor country. Uh, basically, it's because we have not been able to prioritize what we think should be our priority. Uh, so education should be a major priority, and uh, we should be able to uh, have resources to be able to fund our education, particularly public education, because I can tell you that uh, uh, if in the past uh, all our political elites have been able to have quality education, public education, and uh, they are the current uh, crop of leaders, uh, we should be able to pass uh, this uh, to the uh, next uh, generation. So basically, if it is about funds, this can be addressed uh, on the negotiating table. We have seen uh, clearly also how funds, uh, uh, that, uh, funds, t funds that are very funds uh, are also being used uh, in uh, other areas that I think are not of uh, important priority like uh, the uh, issue of education. So uh, it's uh, quite a lot of uh, 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 commitment that is required, but importantly also uh, the fact that uh, time is of essence uh, because five months is not five days. And uh, basically I think all of this will have to come to play for us to be able to find solution. Okay, Mr. Waba, I'm also following, following up on one of Malpe's questions, which is for you to speak to the morality of this uh, solidarity strike, particularly because the Minister of Information had said that the NLC itself is a party to the negotiations uh, the, uh, geared towards seeking an, uh, a solution to the impasse between government and the uh, striking union. So in that regard, uh, how moral is this? Because now you're being accused of taking sides with a party to the negotiation. 
no, we are not taking sides. We are actually affected in the negotiation. What about the morality of keeping the children of the poor and the working class for five months at home? Which one do you think is, has more moral burden? I think we should be able to reflect on all of this. So we are not in solidarity. I've said that severally. NLC is not on a solidarity action. We are affected directly. Because as I'm, I've said also, time without number, if for five months also you have denied all the university workers their salaries and their families are not able to have a better life, is it not also about the issue of uh, burden of morality? Uh, let me try to share this with this. Industrial relation practice have evolved over time. Uh, the issue of master-servant relationship is no longer there globally. We have laws, conventions that guide industrial relation practice. Uh, so the issue of even stopping their salary, whereas it's government that have failed to implement a valid collective bargaining agreement, does not have a place in the rule of law, does not have a place in international covenant, which guides industrial relation globally. Industrial relation globally is guided by international labor conventions, of which Nigeria is a member state. Nigeria have ratified all of those conventions. So I have not heard where Lai Muhammad cited any law that actually put the burden of uh, 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 morality on us. Instead, I think the burden of morality is on them. So basically, I think uh, there have been a, a misinformation or the information have not been uh, uh, well crafted. Secondly, I've told you that we attended the meeting that was also prompted by the initiative of NLC to say, can we do something different from what had been in place? Because those unions have been shuttling between the Office of the Minister of Education and the Minister of Labor. And basically, the issue have remained unresolved. So it was out of our concern. We then said, no, can we write a letter to government to say, can you do something different from what is happening now? In any case, so that we can be able to find solution. And that is how that high-level meeting was convened. And we were there genuinely to try to resolve the issue. I assure you today, uh, uh, even within the two-week timeline that has been allotted, we have already uh, spent uh, uh, one week, I assure you that within 48 hours, unions are still committed. We are committed to driving a process of reaching an understanding and resolving the issue. But I think to add salt to injury, even to compound the issue, their salaries were stopped. And I'm sure that you also know that that will also harden or complicate the issue. That is where we are, because it's about also doing things that will resolve the issue. At the meeting that we had, which I said, our two leaders of faith were there. His Eminence, the Sultan of Sokoto, was at that meeting. And the Khan president was also invited, because they also showed a lot of concern. So all of us were there, and we proved our solution including the fact that you should not even go and pay their salary. I remember that came from our, our, our two very revered uh, uh, religious leaders. They said, no, in this case, go and pay their salary. Let us find a way of resolving the issue. And in the course of the discussion, because the document that need to drive the process of uh, the negotiation was not available, uh, importantly, the report of the BRICS committee was not there. So government said, no, can you give us six weeks so that we can go and uh, tidy up and then come back? And since then, the meeting was adjourned. The meeting was never reconvened. And uh, basically, we think that every time lost is time that cannot be gained. Mm -hmm. And that is. Mr. That should Waba, be a major concern to everybody, let, let's especially quickly, let's we parents talk about, that have children in public schools. Let's quickly talk about the complexity of the issues now. If you consider the position of some, some of the unions on strike over the weekend, uh, specifically Sano and Nasu, uh, which said that uh, they will not be bound by the resolutions of the committee uh, negotiated by ASU. So where does that leave us? You, you said earlier that funds is not necessarily the uh, so, solution, even if there are no funds, but that there's, there should be a commitment. Okay, if government says now that they're committing to this, but we don't have the funds right now, what about this position by uh, Nasu and Sanu? No, you didn't get their position right. Like in 2009, all the unions signed individual collective bargaining agreement as provided by law. ASU will not negotiate for SANU, and ASU will not negotiate for uh, NASU or NAT. And therefore, what they are saying is that, as it was done in 2009, 
those unions, either as their joint action committee or as individual unions, their issues are similar but peculiar, and those issues can also be resolved. I didn't say that money is not involved. Money is involved. But I'm sure also that, as we have done in the past, the major funding mechanism today in our universities is actually something that was initiated by ASU, TED Fund. And the credit must go to ASU. When we are in a similar situation under the military, and we said there is no fund, ASU came up with the template of the TED Fund to say, can we do it this way? Reluctantly, in fact, it was under Babangida regime. It was not actually enacted. Abacha enacted it. And uh, subsequently, when our politicians saw that it's viable, they changed even the concept of it. So it's not about funding. We are dealing with intellectuals. And I'm sure that ASU will usually come to the table well prepared to give solution to where even the funds will come from and also provide solution on how those issues can be addressed, like they brought the issue of UTAS to replace the issue of IPs. So these are the issues, German issues. On the negotiating table, all those issues will be there. And that is how this issue was resolved in 2011, as I said, because it was scaled up to the highest level, and all those facts were put on the table, and those issues were resolved. Well, we've seen different communication from federal government and ASU over months of these negotiations, the latest. You know the Nimic Briggs Committee that the government says, well, look, we can't accept this because of the way the negotiations went and the role I, uh, ASU played in all of this. So how is Labour going to come in? What do you expect from government? And is Labour going to say, well, you can't reject your committee that you set up having come to this? So at what point do you expect perhaps government and ASU to meet themselves? Uh, first, you should realize that uh, either the Babalakin Committee or the Professor Monsley Committee report or now the Breeze Committee report, they are not committees set up by the unions. They are committees set up independently by the government to try to resolve the issue. And therefore, government cannot set up a committee and also come up to now criticize the work of the committee. Uh, and that's why from the beginning, the unions asked whether those committees have full mandate of government to negotiate with them. And that's where the issue of negotiating in good faith comes in. Because under the labor palace, you must negotiate in good faith. You must negotiate to save time. There should be timeline for negotiation. And it must be in good faith. And all other variables will actually be considered at the negotiating table. This is what we have been saying. Uh, so basically, it's not within our privy to say that, well, government have uh, rejected the report. Government should come out clearly to say, well, we've set up a committee. But at the end of the day, as we have done to either the Babalakin committee or the Professor Minjuli uh, committee, we have also rejected the work of the committee. Because why do you allow committee to finish their work uh, before now rejecting the committee? Why not make input while the committee is, ongo is still ongoing? So uh, for, for us, this is entirely time wasting. And basically time wasted cannot be gained. And in this uh, particular uh, issue, I don't think we should actually allow for such time wastage. We should be prompt, we should be smart, we should be able to address the issue within a very specific uh, time frame. Uh, so going forward, I think we should put some urgency in addressing the issue. And we certainly hope so. Uh, five months, as you said, is not five days. But, you know, the Minister of Information and Culture also said that, you know, Labour should insulate itself from politics. And I know for sure that NLC and other Labour unions have said that, you know what, uh, your members should vote for Labour Party. And, I mean, in the build-up to 2023, that might be seen as, well, that's an opposition party, clearly, to the government in power. So from that view, uh, wouldn't you say that, well, Labour might be being partisan as well, or might be viewed as being partisan, since you have publicly declared your support for a party which is considered at least one of the front runners in the race to 2023? Very simple. Uh, the issue of having our children at home required also a political decision for them to go back to school. It's very obvious. What is politics? Policy is about how a state is governed. And let me try to share with you, Labour Party has its own life. NLC as an organization has its own life and structures. Let me also share with you what has been the perspective of NLC. Part of the objective of NLC at foundation is the fact that we protect both the political and economic, political and economic right of workers. It's there. Go and check our constitution. It's there. And that is why the founding fathers of NLC, particularly labor leader number one, Michael Imodu, 
was part of the formation of Workers and Farmers Party in the 60s. He was a member of the NCNC, not as a group, but also to try to defend the interests of the working class. And don't forget, he was also a member of PRP. Labour Party was formed in 1989 by Pascal Bafiao because of that understanding that we have a provision to represent the interests of our members. And Labour Party have been there since then. We only merely changed the name from Party for Social Democracy under Adams to Labour Party in 2003. So basically, you must insulate all of these arguments from doing what is right than mixing it with politics, which is the way a state is actually governed. And uh, globally, workers have played a major role in making sure that their political interests and rights is also defended. So you expect workers to stay aloof when major political parties are selling even the firms at 100 million. Workers cannot afford that with 30,000 naira. So basically, I think there is no connection between what is playing out and also the politics of it. I think uh, the listeners and Nigerians know the truth, and uh, that truth should be able to guide our perspective and, in uh, discussing this issue. And, and, and as there a we have on. Labour Party around the world. Everywhere you hear Labour Party, it actually has something to do with uh, the Labour unions. Right. The Labour Party in the UK is formed by the unions. For 150 years, the office was in the teachers' union in the UK. Uh, in Australia, the Labour Party in government now in Australia was formed by the unions. Uh, same with New Zealand. Same with the Workers' Party in Brazil. In all the Scandinavian countries, they have a relationship with unions because they believe that unions are also citizens. They have interests. They have rights. They can contribute to national development. They should also be part and parcel of uh, the evolution of our democracy. We fought for democracy. You remember uh, people like uh, uh, Franco Cori spent four years right. in Burma prison fighting for democracy, fighting for installation of June 12th. And you say we should just fight for democracy and allow things to go the way it's going without also defending workers' rights and giving workers a perspective. This is the whole argument so about clearly, politics. And Mr. everywhere Obama. around the world. And that's why justice, uh, justice weighs uh, in that very profound judgment of Einek versus Musa said, every civil servant and worker has a right to be a card carrying member of a political party. Well, given... Uh, Comrade Is there, Baba. Go and read it. Einek versus Musa. So essentially, yeah, it, is, it was between Einek. If, if I could come yeah, now, so uh, basically, it's about our rights constitutionally right. provided. Right. So every worker, we don't guide workers because as a worker, as you, as a worker, you have a right to choose any candidate. What we do is to flag up the issues. But okay. you have so, a right so going as back to a the worker, issues now. as a citizen, to, write, to vote any person that you so wish. And let me give you an example. Well, well, Even in the current democratic if, if I could process come in, in the United now, States, uh, just because of we have time. Seen, we have seen members... Uh, Comrade Waba, if you can hear me, pardon me. I, I just need to put this in a as a follow-up. So these are the arguments. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Comrade Waba. I shall just come in now. I, I understand the passion, and you've tried to clear the air. I, I, I just like to follow up with this one. So essentially, you're saying that, well, one, you don't have confidence in this current government. For you to have said, well, our members, you need to collapse your structures and, you know, queue behind the Labour Party and its candidates. So essentially, it's a vote of no confidence on the APC. The PDP as well, which is the main opposition party, and perhaps 15 other political parties. So clearly you're saying that, well, you have faith and confidence in the Labour Party, its candidates, to deliver the kind of reality you expect in the Nigerian state. See, let me, let me share with you, and I've said this severally. Parties are mere structures for people to actually actualize their dream of being elected. And we are not so dogmatic about party. And that's why recently I had a course to say that a candidate of the Labour Party in Adamawa does not meet our criteria, and therefore basically workers should not support him. It's about individuals. Let us not actually confuse ourselves, because that's why people decamp from party A in the morning to party B in the evening to party C the next morning. Because Nigerians are so confused. I think what will make the difference is individual. Even if you are using the Labour Party platform and you don't meet our criteria, we'll come up openly to say you don't meet our criteria. And even if you are using different platform and you meet our criteria, like the case in Kebi, we are one of my DBT is now flying the ticket of a different party, and we say we are going to support him. 
So let's not confuse Nigerians. Nigerians should not be dogmatic about the issue of party. What will make the difference? Because in all the parties, you have the good, you have the bad, and the ugly. What will make the difference is for us to identify individuals. Whatever platform they are using, we should be able to support them because they can be able to offer quality leadership. I think that is how to guide people. And also, this is how we are guiding our members to do what is right. It's their choice. But in making choices, we should be able to educate them. So there is massive workers' education going on. And there is also massive political education of our members because they need to do what they need to do as citizens, exercising their franchise in electing leaders that will actually take us, uh, us out of these wars. So this is what I'm saying in essence. So we are not so dogmatic about the issue of party, no. Yes, we need a party so that if you are denied a platform elsewhere because of the cost of the form, you can then have a platform where we can give you form. Most of the forms given by Labour Party are even free. Most of the forms are free. The form you gave to the presidential candidate. Yeah, some. Party. If you have resources, no, you can I, donate. I just want to clarify the one you gave to the presidential yes, candidate. Some, some, some given by the party, let not me presidential. Let me add a lot of Yes, question. let me try to explain to you. Yes, if I just you wanted have, to clarify yes, if the one does, that the presidential candidate of your party what, got what was the, it free. What the party informed us, because the party has its own structure, it has yeah. a little life, okay. it's guided by the INEG rule and the constitution of the party. Mm -hmm. But what they inform us is. Any of our members that don't have the required resources, and I know many of them, they will be allowed to have the forms free. Okay. But if also you have resources, but the and you say you want to donate, the yeah, party they can donate. They, paid, can, they, paid can, donate. they can pay and donate to the party. But it's not compulsory. How much you, do you know he paid? Well, I don't know. The party, I think you can invite the party because the party has its own life. Okay. It has its own structure. It's run under the rules of INEC. I just and therefore, to... we don't interfere also in the way they run the party. What would you say to those who think that this particular protest of the NLC today is misplaced? You've talked about education and how the children of the poor are sitting at home um, are not able to, you know, and the working class are not able to go to school. But for a number of people, they think that the emphasis should be at the primary and secondary level where, you know, we're having a, a, a lot of problems with the primary education. We're also having huge and humongous challenges with secondary education. Many people now have their children in private institutions, but there is you know, very little call or pressure on government to reform the education system, the government education system um, at these basic levels. Um, what is your response to that? All of them are very, very important. Primary, secondary, and tertiary. What makes the issue of the public university is different, is that it has been shut down for five months. We are not talking of reforming the process now. We are talking of even opening the school so that our children can be uh, in school. Let me tell you also the, uh, another leg of it. Already we have three sets of students that are waiting admission and that their admission is now hanging in the balance because of the strike. Three sets. And the totality of those we are talking about I was told it's within the region of 10 million. The three sets that have not been admitted, those that are already in school, they are at home, they are within the region of 10 million. So it's something that is very, very important. And it's more important than any other thing, I think. And that is why we are prioritizing this to say, this is important. This is about the life of a complete generation that we need to defend, that we need to protect. And in most cases, they are children of the working class and the less privileged. Mm. Well, we have to thank you for your time with us this morning. Uh, the protest is going to be happening in Lagos. and Is it, is it happening all over the federal cap? Uh, sorry, it's happening the today, today in all the states. Okay. But that of the national will be tomorrow here in Abuja. Okay, so Abuja is not going to be seeing yes, any, any protest? Yes, the national one tomorrow in Abuja. Are we going to be expecting any electricity outages? No. It's not about actually strike. It's about a national protest, okay. which is the first leg. So all of so these headlines no we're seeing about electricity, bank, aviation workers. No, they are joining the protest. Joining all the... our 50 affiliates, okay. they are actually joining the protest. They are joining the protest, but, yes, services, all the 50, will not be but services will not be disrupted. Okay. It's after this entire process that then we go to the next stage. And we hope we don't go to the next stage. And that's why we are giving all this latitude and also uh, raising the issue and also using... Uh, the, the, the protests of today to actually scale up the issue, that uh, attention needs to be given to the issue, and uh, time is also of essence. 
Well, thank you so much for coming on Sunrise Daily this, this morning. Comrade Ayuba Waba is the president of the Nigeria Labour Congress and has been speaking to us on the planned protest um, of the Congress in all the states of the federal capital of the Federation today. Um, and there will be a major one tomorrow. Thank you once again for your time this morning. Well, thank you very much. I think also thank you for uh, giving us this platform to shed more light on the issues. We take a break at this point and we'll be back shortly to discuss Toby Amushan's victory in just a moment. Please stay with us. Come back. Well, yeah, we can't get enough of that uh, historic moment uh, by Toby Amosan right there. But as you've seen, we've got uh, Falila Tugunkoya, who is a 1996 Olympic 400 meter bronze medalist. She joins us this morning to weigh in this achievement, this huge feat. Good morning, and thank you for joining us on the program today. Well, oh dear, it appears as though we lost her. But you know, I was going to wonder for those of us watching it from home, wherever you sit at. It's a different kind of feeling oh, absolutely. when you watch it. Yes, it's happy, but yeah, we've got you back now. So I was asking, for those of us watching it from wherever we are, it could be a different feeling. Yes, happy and joyous, but for the athletes, I mean, you've been there as well, but getting that medal, world record, what kind of emotions, how do you feel? How do you explain the scenario in this her case, for instance? Can you hear us? Okay, I was trying to see if you can just sort the all of that. Okay, so could you go ahead and talk to us about the emotions? I mean, I know you put a lot into preparations, your training, years, almost like a lifestyle. But winning that, talk us through what went through your mind. How was your own reaction to that world record feat that she set there? Okay, uh, the night talks just playing tricks on us today where well, we lost that completely. But yeah, you know, it, it's always a different feel when you watch it. And then, but if you're right there and then, there's several things that come through your mind. Eventually, even saw that uh, when she mounted the podium, uh, the national anthem rendition went through different sets of emotions entirely. Mm -hmm. And this is a lifetime moment. Mm -hmm. So it's just etched there, right there in history. And you could imagine all the sacrifice you must have gone through. The lifestyle sacrifices. I mean, this is a like living your life like a living sacrifice for <laughs> yes. sports to achieve this. Absolutely. But boy, look at that. Uh, wow. You know, I, I think for, uh, for a lot of athletes, especially Nigerians, this is like a major win. I know all of us, the 200 million Nigerians, are, are holding on to this, but particularly mm. for the athletes, because it's, it's quite tough, really, applying your trade as an athlete in Nigeria, across board, not just for tracks, yeah. field events, and, and all of that. It's, it's a major challenge. So you have to grapple with a lot of things before you even get in the main arena itself. And mm -hmm. then you have to try to focus and compete with others who, let me say, have it smooth, as it were. I mean, in mm -hmm. terms of preparation, support, in terms of the system, funding, and all of that. So I imagine for a lot of them, this <coughs> win is big. And particularly uh, mm -hmm. for Madam Falila Togunkoya, exactly, what, 26 years ago, it was still in July that she actually got the bronze, the bronze medal, medal yeah. in, in Atlanta mm -hmm. Olympics. I, I, and I think it's just, 
You know, it's, it's a big deal, really. And you, know, you forgive us. In fact, you don't need to forgive <laughs> us for celebrating this. Yeah. Because we're essentially trying to pull out, you know, the, the win in this and, and showing that we can actually do a lot more if we just put very little things in place. I mean, it's not too much to ask for. Mm -hmm. And I've seen different write-ups mm -hmm. talking about the experiences of athletes. I mean, the basketball team is it's one that we remember. At all. At all. I mean, having qualified, they had to beat, I think, the top the, the fifth best team in the world, I think it was France, they beat on the way to actually clinch that particular uh, ticket or in the build-up to it generally. And eventually, they lost out to it. And I can give examples. The Falcons recently had to protest. Don't forget. Mm. I, I, you know, they, mm. they protested on, on, on the pitch. They, they hadn't gotten allowances and all of that. And in spite of that, they had to fight, uh, you know, the host nations at that, you know, semi-final match. And they still try to come up with something. So I think it's a win for you know the Nigerian athletes out there who, in spite of all of the challenges they go through, yeah. try to make out something. So mm -hmm. where to go, Toby? Uh, and it's an interesting question that I, I would have loved, you know, Madam Ogunkoya to respond to. And yeah, thank you, Kadi. The more reason we should celebrate Nigerian artists, the more reason we should lift, you know. To be shoulder high, the sheer resilience, you know, considering the treatment that they got, being stranded at the airport, no allowances, you know, somebody was making an observation that during that big win, there were very few Nigerian fans at the stadium there, you know, to congratulate her, to celebrate with her. I, in fact, saw her, you know, being shaken by, you know, the foreign fans at the venue. So these are the, Everybody loves victory. Some, some of the issues. <laughs> victory. Yeah, victory has many everybody fathers, loves right? victory. But where are the Nigerian fans, you know? And it could be somewhere in the budget that some Nigerian fans had been sponsored to go to that uh, uh, venue. Or, or at least Oregon. some sort of support system. Yeah, some sort of, yeah. some sort of support, but, you know, it's, it's not there. So how can we then sustain they, you know, such talents, ensure that we keep sending young talents beyond congratulating to that. other championships, beyond yeah. congratulating to be a motion. There you go. Well, take a look at some comments coming through. We've got this one from uh, Professor Enahena, who talks about ASU. Uh, he says, ASU and federal government should work together to forestall this nerve-wrenching strike. The students and parents bear the brunt of this unending strike. That's well, this one strike too many. Okay, this is one strike too many. Prominent Nigerians should interv intervene to end this perennial impasse. I wonder which other prominent Nigerian can intervene. We've had the religious leaders. And how? Gosh. <laughs> they do that? Professor Sekimboyewa has this one about, you know, the elections. Uh, the confusion we're seeing in regards to INEC candidates in 2023 elections shows that there is need to further work and modernize our electoral law. We want an electoral law that candidates, political parties and voters can easily understand and follow the rules. Well, that's been the show. Uh. Mark Ray. Indeed, it has been the show, and what a lot to you know take in and internalize this morning. But I'm glad that we're ending on, an, on a note of optimism yeah. that yeah. we can still aspire to greatness regardless of what is thrown at us. And I think that's the spirit which uh, Toby has managed to inspire. Uh, in spite of all that's been thrown at her, she has not relented in her own personal e effort. And look what glory the country is basking in as a result of that. Well, thank you so much for watching this morning. I'm Mao Kwe I mean, it's amazing what one man, in this case, what one woman has done. So, yeah, you can change the world by all means. I'm Kayode Okikyolu. Indeed, perhaps we should all follow Toby's example. As far as 2016, she said it that it was going to happen. So there's power in your words this morning. Remember that. Thank you for watching. I am Bukola Samuel Wemimo. But don't also forget, you didn't follow her laps. There's discipline, there's hard work, there's <laughs> patience. Mm -hmm. I'm Chamberlain Oso. We'll see you next time.